My name is Hatija. I work for Ravensbourne in the commercial department and I'm chairing this session this afternoon on independent 3D with a very experienced panel. What we're going to do is go down, let everybody introduce themselves and just um, explain what, they're, what they've been doing in 3D, where they're going with 3D. Um, and then I'd like you to sort of let us know what you think the greatest challenge is for independent producers who want to be working in 3D today. So if we start with you, Simon. Okay. Do you want us to introduce, introduce ourselves individually first? And yeah, let's, if you introduce yourself and we'll show the, okay. the clip and we'll go down. Okay, well I'm, uh, I'm Simon Craddock. Um, I'm the CEO of Onsite, based here in London. Uh, we've probably made, um, certainly been involved in over 100 3D productions in the last five years. Um, I'm quite an unusual animal in a way because we provide the shoot solution from Shepparton Studios as well as the post solution in London's West End. Very fortunate um, in many ways that uh, we've kind of been involved in some of the UK's really high-end 3D. I've just caught some of um, Anthony Geffen's um, and David Attenborough's journey about 3D um, in NFT1 and we were in lucky to be involved in uh, all of those fantastic projects. But we're also involved in uh, independent 3D as well. 3D where, well the budgets are always challenging with 3D, but um, certainly some of the smaller projects um, are also very challenging. Um, what I'd like to do probably first of all is just to illustrate some of the projects we're involved in by showing a brief showreel um, cut to music if that's okay. Um, just, to, just to look out in the showreel for a wedding video which we also helped with uh, a couple of years ago. You'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine, over to you. Hi there. <coughs> is this working? Um, my name is Catherine Owens and I'm the, the director and the producer on a film called U2-3D and for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm going to show a little very short clip of that film. And um, I also uh, did a little spot last year that I wanted to show you. Um, I haven't actually seen it on the scale, it was a little test that we did that actually Buzz Hayes, who's here I think, <laughs> produced uh, with me for B-Sky <coughs> test that we did with Coldplay. And I wanted to show it to you, it's shot in the TD300, which is a prosumer camera from Sony. Um, so this isn't exactly the scale it should be viewed at, but I want to show it to you because it was very low budget and it was made in a rather creative way, so we can talk about it after we've seen it. Thanks. So, do you think it's unfair that, that to say that 3D is still too expensive for, for many independent filmmakers? I've, I've been doing independent 3D filmmaking since uh, 1991. And if, if you go on to the 21st Century 3D YouTube channel, you can see that film that I made. So I've always had a very indie approach. And even when I do work on Hollywood films, uh, I think that that approach is important because you don't want to waste money, you don't want to do anything inefficiently. Just because something is the most expensive system doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. And, uh, you know, not to, not to backtrack, but again, I mean, I think that, in my opinion, independent production is the last best hope for 3D cinema. Because although we do have great films coming out of Hollywood like Gravity, I think that it's far outstripped by the number of, of poor quality 3D that we're seeing from Hollywood where, you know, the, the bottom line is the bottom line. I just want to charge some more for a movie and put that little 3D logo on the poster so people think it's 3D. And the problem that's been created by that is that the audience's expectation of what they're going to get from a 3D product when they go to the cinema is very cloudy. Is it going to be gravity or is it going to be some very poorly done film? Independent is, I think, the best thing that we can hope for because you guys are all in control of your own films and as Simon said, YouTube as a platform is just unprecedented. I met a guy at an international 3D society meeting who was, couldn't have been 20 years old. He's got over 5 million views of a video of him shoving a cat at a, uh, at a webcam. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't think that that work is necessarily indicative of super high quality 3D, but it got me thinking. You know, prior to 2006, the inception of YouTube, to get 5 million people to look at anything that you've produced, you would have needed to have a studio contract or a television show or something. So 
everyone says, oh, this is a revolution, but when you think about those numbers and you think about the potential access that you have to viewers, it's staggering. Mm -hmm. And you know, to that point, I mean, my my desire for the, the industry, because I think you can't really have one without the other, is that the um, you know the, the the large scale studios have their own issues, and if you're working in three D, you know, you you hear through the grapevine some of their own issues. All of it comes back down to the bottom line of how many. TV sets are they selling? How many cameras are they selling? And if they're not selling the cameras and they're not selling the TV, uh, the TV sets, they're simply not going to support the medium. So there is there is a place there for independent 3D film for sure. Um, but then again, at that end, it's the it's the teaching. How, uh, for example, how many of the film schools um, are capable or able to put up a really good course in 3D filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So places like Ravensbourne and Onsite and B Sky B, you know, the Coldplay piece we made with them using their facility um, to turn around the test. So, you know, so there's ways to make things. Um, it's just, you know, there's got to be a lot of ingenuity going on in how, how you get there. Is there anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, well, the, plat the platforms are growing. You know, we talked about YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. I think it'd be nice to share with everybody about your app in yeah. a second. But also, I mean, I've been carrying around in my bag, I tend to most of the time now, a glasses-free uh, 3D tablet. And actually, the I Hold could it show up. it to Hold you. Hold it up. Hold it up. You know what a tablet looks like. It's in, there's my bag. It's in my bag. I'll show you later if anybody wants to see it. But actually, the images are surprisingly good. They're surprisingly good, and they're not in the shops yet. Uh, but they absolutely will be, and certainly my children growing up, they're 8 and 11 at the moment, they're going to be wanting to watch content more on the tablets than they are on the television, which, you know, for them, and there's some great examples of uh, glasses-free televisions, obviously, here as well, and that, that is definitely coming as well. So, as we all know, if the platforms are there, the content needs <coughs> to be there, you know, it's a chicken and egg thing, but uh, the chicken and the egg are coming along now. <laughs> so, and yeah. just, just on, on that, to follow up on that, uh, so I'm working, I'm advising um, a German company called 3Do. I don't know if any of you know about them, but they're an online, they're, they're, they're developing a video on demand for online 3D viewing. And <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I, part of my advising them is completely self-serving because I have nowhere to put the content I'm making. So even though, you know, you work at, you know, I've had the, had the opportunity to work at the one particular level with you too, I've got other projects that, you know, there is no distribution for because they're not theatrical projects, they're broadcast so they go out once, so, you know, they're, they're, there has to be somewhere. So the 3Do um, app will allow you to, it, it, it's sort of like a cross between Vimeo and Netflix, it will allow you to look at content from major studios, but it will also allow you upload your own content, share your content, etc. My opinion, you know, 3Do are another uh, company that this is going to be the way of the future. So, with that kind of in mind and where that's all going, I mean, I think it's really exciting. It's still so young, so it's up to the community of 3D filmmakers to really tighten up and be together and go forward. I think there's another important point we should touch on is that uh, it's no secret that there's been a decline in live action stereoscopic production worldwide as compared to 2010 and 2011. And while that's a sad story on the one hand, for independent producers that's actually a very big opportunity because uh, gear that was two years ago maybe $10,000 a day to rent some of it you can buy on eBay for incredibly low numbers and you can rent very inexpensively. Um, we've seen some of the largest uh, 3D production companies and rental houses downsizing tremendously or even going completely out of business. And that means there's a huge glut of 3D gear out there in the marketplace. Catherine was talking about shooting the Coldplay piece with a, a TD300. I mean, there was a point in time not that long ago where you couldn't touch one of those for less than $1,500 a day. So there's people out there that have this equipment that are looking for opportunities, co-production opportunities, low-budget rental opportunities, and any independent 3D producer should absolutely be looking into that and thinking about that. Okay, last question for me before we open up for audience questions. What do you think needs to happen in the next year to open that door a bit wider for independent 3D production and distribution? What would you like to be talking about this time next year at the summit? 
I'd like to talk about the uh, film festival that's starting here. You know, not, not a massive film festival, but let's encourage, let's encourage 3D to be used. You know, as Jason said, you know, there's opportunities uh, to shoot out there. But I'm not a producer, but the reality is, you know, we see some production companies being very smart with their budgets. You know, if you want to go travelling around the world with a load of 3D kits, it's going to be expensive. You know, you can have a fantastic production as a result, but, you know, you can shoot stuff in a studio, you can be very smart about 3D, control your tra talent, control your budget, control your, you know, expenses, and you can still come up with a great project. So there, there are ways, there are ways and means to do it. For me, um for me, I, I'm very, very uh, bent on the education side. So I want to see more three D being taught, and um, both, you know, both in both stereoscopically and in relation to the VFX and the conversion and the all of it. I just want I want I want every film school to have some course that relates to three D training. Uh, you know, I'm still very positive about three D, despite some of the things that I've said that might not <laughs> sound completely positive. I think that next year, I'm, I'm looking at this as just a, an evolutionary process. The revolution happened, as we saw with the U2 clip, several years ago. And uh, 3Ality and James Cameron, and I'd like to think 21st Century 3D and OnSite, and everybody who's been doing this for so long were part of that. But now it's an evolution. These tools are out there, the knowledge is out there, and uh, you know the venue for it is there. There are thousands of movie theaters. There are, I know people who have gotten movies, independent movies, into theaters by going and making deals directly with the movie theater. I'm not saying that's necessarily a very efficient way to do it, but you've got to just, there are no rules. And uh, if you're an independent filmmaker and an independent thinker, between YouTube and, and the variety of different things we three do and that we've been talking about here today, I think there's more opportunity now for a 3D filmmaker and more places where the work could have a life. You know, Florian was here earlier talking about an independent production it was a $50 million independent production, of course. But uh, there's obviously all levels. And you know, I was initially not planning to show that helicopter footage, but it occurred to me that I'm always thinking in terms of indie filmmaking. And the micro aerial fits into that. Because even though your independent production might not be able to uh, afford a full-size helicopter and all the expenses and liability that go along with that, thinking of things on a smaller scale, but being creative, you can make a $100,000 production look like a million dollar production, and a million dollar production look like a $10 million production. So I think there's more opportunity now than ever, and I would just like to see more people over the course of the next year exploring 3D. No one's going to dive in right away and make U2 3D. No one's going to dive in right away and make a, a, you know, a record setting David Attenborough uh, sort of huge thing. It's just little baby steps, and I'd love to see more people taking those steps in the course of the next year. It's a very optimistic point in which we can go to audience questions. Anybody got a question for our panel? Yeah. Uh, yeah, good talk, nice talk. What, where do you get your budgets from for your independence, freely making making that? Kind of how, the, how do you get your budgets That's a from? wide open question. I mean, I think it's going to depend. We, we got to sort of qualify what is an independent production. Obviously, what Florian Mayer was talking about earlier was an independent uh, international production with a huge sum of money behind it. And that was private investors, from what I understand, just from speaking with him. On a smaller scale, it can come from anywhere. So on the, I made peace for broadcast last year also with B Sky B on an Irish dancer. So for that budget, I think the budget was, I think total budget was somewhere between 96 and 110 or 115,000 euros. And um, that was partially funded by the Irish Film Board and then partially funded by private, in private investors, just people who put in 5,000 here and 10,000 there. But then for the post, I did a deal with, with Sky whereby I, um, instead of being paid for distribution rights, we did a deal where I got to do my post-production edit there on site. So that was a way to make it cost effective. So um, on YouTube 3D, it was just one particular family in America who were big YouTube fans and had a, a lot of money and were developing with uh, 3Ality Digital. They were developing the cameras and the rigs, and together they, they put up the money for the film. So that would have been how that went. Know someone rich is the answer to that question. <laughs> That's also helpful. Yeah, I, I obviously, I ditto on everything the guys said there, but you know, also, um, 
uh, industry, of course, is an opportunity with 3D. You know, we've, we would have seen in our showreel that we've had done a commercial for both Audi and um, Mercedes in the past. And actually, we've, we've been working on a number of little 4K, uh, sort of 4K, sorry, 4D uh, rides. Uh, we worked on one for Skoda towards the end of last year, sort of experience rides, you know, that sort of go move around the country. So, you know, there's, put your thinking hat on, you know, depending on what you want, what you're looking to sell, what, what story you're looking to tell, there may be somebody interested. Um, in the last couple of years, there have been some like, exciting and interesting independently made 3D projects that found success at 3D film festivals around Europe and the one in LA and stuff, and opportunities for students to make these films. Um, do you think that in the near future they'll become even more ambitious, maybe see some feature films, independently low budget made 3D features, um, possibly getting picked up by distributors and having wide releases? Because obviously the general public, the only 3D cinema they're ever exposed to is Hollywood mainstream studio films. Will there be an opportunity in the near future for independently made 3D to make it into cinemas, wide theatrical releases, and for the general public to be able to see some of the more you know, some of these interesting projects that independent filmmakers have been working on? I have to say I really hope so because um, we're working with a client of ours at the moment who's looking to make um, a motor racing uh, 3D independent feature film, uh, which is very, very exciting. And um, hopefully they're able to close finance uh, in, the next, in the next month or so because that's, that's the sort of film that I'd like to see on general release, not just because we're involved, but uh, a very exciting project. I think the, f the film that most, uh, to date, that most go goes to what you're saying about is Vin Vendor's Pina. So it, it had a wide release, you know, it was made, it had a wide release and had a, a very large success, both critically and commercial, uh, commercially, because of the quality of the work. So I think that's a pretty good example. I would say the opportunity is here, uh, you know, in terms of getting a wide release and, and really being appealing to audiences, that's up to you guys. We've, we've yet to see anyone make the Blair Witch, the El Mariachi, the Paranormal Activity, that, that little $100,000 film that just hits a nerve and suddenly everybody has to see it. Sundance has been screening 3D for the past two years. Now, I'm not saying any of this is easy to do. You've got to write a really good script. You've got to be very smart about how you spend your money. You've got to take advantage of some of the things that we've been talking about here. Go make a deal with someone who has a rental house that has 3D gear that's been sitting there for two years. Uh, you know, you got to just have a creative mind beyond the filmmaking from a business standpoint. But when someone makes that film that is just the right film, that appeals to audiences, that's you know the right subject matter to shoot it on a low budget, and the quality of the 3D is there, I think. I think it'll hit. I've been not. I can't say that I've been waiting. I've been pushing so many people and so many projects to try and do this. That brass ring is still out there, and nobody has grabbed it. Now's your time. <laughs> Go. It's only five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, time for just one last question, actually. Um, I'm quite interested. Um, Sorry, if you just wait for the mic, is that okay? I'm quite interested to hear. For me, it seems to be a bit of a contradiction in terms to hear about cheap 3D, because... Uh, not cheap, we're not saying cheap, independent, economical, okay. <laughs> economical. Oh, okay, a bit of leeway then. Um, what would you consider to be a good price, say, per rig for any project, you know, just generally speaking? What's, where's the economy? Because for you two things, very interesting, because, I mean, the budget seems ridiculously small, so it's a question for both of you, really. Um, well, y y you know, how much per camera rig? So you just consider to Coldplay, be a normal not, not rig? you two. You two no, is expensive. Two is a hefty budget, but the, the Coldplay, uh, it really, the thing is that was a prosumer camera. That's a camera you can go out and buy for how much buzz was that camera? Yeah. How much? Thirty-five thousand. Yeah. Three thousand five hundred dollars. Thirty-five thousand. Oh, sorry, thirty-five thousand. No, but what was the what was the other? There was one. There was one. Uh, NX three D was thirty five hundred. Okay, yeah. But you know, you, again, it depends on what camera you're looking for and what you're trying to achieve, and you know how you're, you know how you're going to work. That there's some people who are assisting on another project, and in order and in return for assisting, they'll get 
some time on a camera. I mean, there's just so many ways. The but prices. It, but it, it really depends where you're delivering to, where your content's going, and what the quality of the content needs to be. A lot of the productions we work on um, with Colossus and Anthony Geffen and B Sky B, um, they're projects that end up going to giant screen, to IMAX. And so you've got to acquire at a very high level, 4K, 5K, um, and stay at that level to deliver all the way to the screen. So obviously that's going to dictate a higher price. The, you know, the, the tolerances are obviously uh, much smaller, so the quality has to be that much better. Mm -hmm. and Consequently, you need the quality staff to go with it, so the team has to grow. Um, so it really depends where you're pitching it. Now, if you're using a TD300, you might want, I don't know where you'd pitch that kind of material once broadcast. you've made that broadcast. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, certain broadcast. I was going to say, at this moment <laughs> in time, um, it was a test, but Sky wouldn't allow 100% TD300 program on their channel. It would only be up to 25%. So it's about, it's about getting the balance and where the content would be going. I'm always very wary of talking about you know hard numbers and percentages and whatever. I, I'm pretty confident that there's someone out there who can make a 3D production with a TD300 or any camera. I don't even want to mention a particular camera, but do it in such a way that when you present it to people, it's impressive and they're not going to ask you, was two minutes of this shot with that or two minutes with that? The other thing that Simon mentioned that I think is very important is we're talking about 4K and 5K and, and these sort of things. I shot an independent feature film uh, in 2009 with red MX cameras that were very expensive at the time both financially and computationally in terms of processing footage but there there's literally there's a litany of 4k cameras available now some of which are very inexpensive including red 1 MX I see them on eBay for three thousand dollars so someone's got to be renting them very inexpensively and I, I don't want anyone to misconstrue anything that I'm saying in terms of low cost and efficient 3D to equate to poor quality 3D. I think that everything Simon is saying is true. The tolerances of the gear, the alignment of your cameras, these are all critical. But I would, I would shy away from saying, well, this their rig should cost that much and this rig should cost that much. I would, again, encourage everyone, if you've got a project that's compelling, you've got to find the right rental company or the right 3D production company and partner with them. And, you know, it's like, there are no rules. Make, make the deal that makes your movie. And definitely don't compromise on the quality if you're able to get, you know, Red Scarlet, Red Epic even is last year's news. You know, if you're all right with not shooting with an Alexa XT or an Alexa M or a Red Dragon, you can achieve tremendously cinematic results. Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Ties was shot with a Red 1 MX, or maybe not even MX at the time. So the point is, all of this here is totally cinematic, and there's a bit of a strange thought process going on where if you don't have the up-to-the-minute thing, suddenly it's crap, and that's just not the case. So I would encourage people to, again, don't, don't be focused on we have to use this particular thing. Focus on your idea, and then find someone who can help you achieve that idea. Well, um, we've actually at the end of the session now, so I'd just like to say thank you to Catherine, Simon and Jason for sharing your experiences.